Hello, everyone. My name is Christian Roberts. I'm the director of education for the Dallas Opera, and I'm here with my fabulous co-host, Quo Johnson, education and company culture manager for the Dallas Opera. And we have a very special guest with us today. I will let him introduce himself, but I have to tell you, this guy, he knows this stuff. Sir, would you please tell us who you are? Hello, hello. I am David Lomeli. I'm the director of artistic administration at the Dallas Opera. All right. So today we're going to do a little recap like we did last week. But first of all, let me thank everybody for joining us. We appreciate you supporting TDO and TDO Network. We appreciate you supporting Taking the Stage with Christian and Quo. <laughs> and we want to um, do a little recap from last week. Um, Last week, we, in the past two episodes, in fact, we talked about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And last week, we extended on that a little bit and expanded on it and asked why it matters, why that work matters. So I'm going to go to our resident expert, Quo Johnson, so she can do a little recap for us and get us to understand why that matters. Thank you, Christian. <laughs> so we spoke about why equity, diversity, and inclusion matter and why the work is necessary. Um, in this previous episode, we spoke about how it matters because if we're creating art for everyone, then everyone needs to be included in that art. And as we include others into the art or into any of the work that we're doing, we need to be mindful of historical context, right? We need to be mindful of fairness. We need to be mindful of equity or the lack thereof. And then we need to be mindful that we cannot simply collect people based on their diversity, but treat people like human beings, right? Treat others the way mm -hmm. you want to be treated, include them into decisions that you're making, and then open the space so that people can participate in art, so they can value it, so they can protect it, so they can sustain it. Very good. I always love when you give our recaps. They're very clear and concise. Mm -hmm. um, so this leads us into another su subject matter, which is why David is with us today. Uh, one of the things we want to talk about is representation, representation in the arts, representation in opera, of course, because that's what the three of us happen to be on, on the, that's the platform we happen to be on right now. Mm -hmm. um, but we want to talk about you know, our experiences with this. Um, and so some of the things that we're going to talk about today, there will probably be a lot of people out there that can relate to them. I have no doubt. Um, as we say all the time, please leave us your comments. Um, so let's just get right into this thing. Let's talk representation. Um, first of all, David, you, you sit in a very unique position uh, where you are at the casting table, you are making artistic decisions. Um, and we always talk about, and the three of us have had many conversations about this just within our own little, little triangle, if you will, about this. So can you tell me some of your experiences with representation in opera? Like what have you seen over the years? Has it changed? Has it gotten better? I think that, you know, I have to say that it has gotten better, but it, but it still feels uh, a sense of, I, I would say that it, it's kind of, uh, there's a word that I'm trying to find in English, but it's, it's utilizing uh, or, or using certain issues to, to monetize or to appease, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. for the right substance, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I feel that we have chosen to to push the agenda of diversity and inclusion, but sometimes it doesn't have the artistic basis that it has. We don't address the pipeline. We just try to, uh, I have had interviews uh, in through the years, you know, when when I was, you know, trying to, to explore maybe other sources of, of employment. So I was, uh, I was with, a, I won't name where, but I, I was interviewing for a, kind of like artistic direct position in a very important company. And the CEO told me at the time, he's like, well, I need more color on my stage. And I was like, well, yeah, but like, which piece are you going to do? Like, like, are they prepared to sing it? Like, what, 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 is, what is your artistic concept, right? Like, what, 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 what are you trying to convey with this? Like, and he said, well, you know, when I, when I cast more color, there's, there's a different demographic in my audience. And he's like, well, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's a good consequence, right? I just, for me, especially being a Mexican tenor that had to pay more than $65,000 in visas to compete. And at the time that I was competing, I could compete in the world competition of Placio Mingo de Operalia, but I could not compete at the Metropolitan Opera National Council. Mm -hmm. I'd have a little beef on that, that there's, you know, like, there, it's not fair to compete. Like I have to pay that much to just be at the same level, right? Of competition at, at the same audition. 
I have to pay that much, right? And that's, and already my, where I come from is very, very disadvantageous to, to, to compete. So that, that I have already there. And then not trying to have, uh, suddenly just give you wild cards because it doesn't matter if it's good or not. I, it doesn't feel fair either. For me, it's like, how are we training? How are we penetrating audiences concisely, develop them correctly, and then go into, into that matter. So I hear that at the high level. It's like, you know, I need more color on the stage. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes uh, when we want to do pieces that may be controversial, like, you know, Madame Butterfly, now I hear a lot, it's like, who's the next Asian soprano that we can do? And it's like, well, but are we going to do Chinese? Are we doing Korean? Are we do Japanese? Like, are we going to go real? You know, it's, 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 it's the same thing that I feel that when we try today to bring the, the, the black community, we, we do certain pieces. There's also Latin American uh, pieces. We do Katana, we do the mariachi. And it's like, well, you know, it's, it's, it's iconization for the wrong, I, I feel that is the wrong way to piece it because then there's no segue, there's no fellowship. So that, that is one of the conflicts that I feel on representation in opera. I, in my high also table is that I am the very first Hispanic casting director of a level one opera company in professional opera history in the United States. So it's the very first minority at the table. So I bring a lot of my own baggage, my flavor for the language. Like I'm critical of the training. I'm critical on the language. I'm critical of certain things. And people are like, well, you're too tough. And I'm like, but that's the language we're singing, right? Like that, that's, that's the standards that we're trying to achieve. Why are we passing them for some and not for others? Uh, I hear, uh, as I was telling you a little bit of before uh, of camera, I people don't know how to say that they are doing a racist decision about something in good or like in good or bad if they want to if there's a good racism but like they they are like things like we want more color but why is there an artistic basis does it tell the story better right um there there was this very famous thing that I have I have actually been very public about it we were involved on, or we're still involved to do a new production of the John Adams and um, Mr. Peter Sellers, Girls of the Golden West, the premiere in San Francisco Opera a few years ago and has gone to the Netherlands. And the story, uh, the way, when, when I read the script as a minority myself, I was so excited because he was, he was, he was not apologetic. He was not trying to sweeten the pill. He mm -hmm. told how the Mexicans, the blacks and the Asians got abused in, in their golden rush era. Right. Mm -hmm. but then when the cast came in, I was like, okay, I hope that they somehow like kind of are going to help me through the staging to understand because they tried to do blind color casting ah. in an <laughs> opera that it was so particular ah. about to make it work, you need to cast the right ethnicity. This opera had the potential that if you put in, you know, there was there were moments where the protagonist that in the letters and in the like the context that it was made of, it's a white lady falling in love with a free slave. But then they casted two black performers in in the leads. So then then suddenly there was no taboo, mm -hmm. right? Or they cast a black performer as the Mexican, and in the era of two thousand and plus to not find a mezzo that sings Spanish mm -hmm. is, 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 is hard, right? With, with all the dreamers and the green cards that we are here. And, and, and on top of that, they, they, you know, it felt a little bit like, like there was a, a, a blanket statement again, you know, like we need more color on the stage, but we have to do it with substance and we have to tell the story right. That's and I, and in, the, in the situation when I started coming and I was trembling, believe me, I did a, when I finally got into the conversation and God bless for my two balls, I have to shut down, like shout out to, to Emmanuel and Ian when they, when we had the casting meeting with Peter and with John, I said, the, I'm sorry for, for this, but for me, when I, when I saw your beautiful libretto and your gorgeous music, for me, I said like, this is the immigrant opera. This is the one, this is not the mariachi. This is not, you know, blue. This is not the, this is the, this is the immigrant opera where we tell the story of how he, we really feel. We don't try to vanilla size. We don't try to uh, uh, like tell a, a, a redemption. There's no redemption. We were like screwed, right? And there was a lot of pain and human, like kind of putting us together, kind of a human aspect of putting us together. 
above that thing when we raise up from those things um but then when you when you kind of like put the villains to look the same as the as they're affected you actually apologize and they were like well we wanted to give a, a presence of hope and they said but you actually diluted the message like you had a golden piece here where you your 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 privileged position was able that a major opera house gave you that platform but now all the this this franchise people that that could actually run for you they didn't feel represented they actually feel cheated you know and and so that's 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 some of the experiences that i that i have felt you know and i have and i think between the three of us we have a few but i have i have my good collection (laughs) well and it's just it's i think it's sometimes you know ko and i often discuss how you know sometimes you can be made to feel alone Mm -hmm. Uh, in these situations and while we may be of different backgrounds and all of that that some of we have some very we have some commonalities and then we have stuff of our own and we talk about how it's not the fresh oppression olympics um and and or anything like that but the fact that we 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 are aware of these things and we go through these things and they're very real for people of color so um and any quote unquote what they call marginalized group which is a term i have to wrestle with all the time because you know you say I'm on the margins. I mm-hmm. mm. um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave that there. That's another subject for another day. Um, Quo, can we can we talk a little bit about because we talk about creating spaces mm-hmm. and we talk about creating spaces where everybody feels where people feel like they can contribute all the time. We talk about this all the time. We talked about this in la- our last show and hearing David talk about what he just talked about. And some of those kind of those conversations he's had and some of those experiences he's had, you know, what are some solutions? Are there are, are there solutions? And I know there's not just one. <laughs> you know, I know there's not just one take on this, but can you as a as a person who sees this through through several different lenses, talk about that a little bit? Again, yeah, as you said, there are there's not just one solution and then there's not just one immediate solution but in several of the things that david just shared with us there's so many things there's the performative allyship right or the yes. performative diversity the checkbox mentality that we've spoken about mm-hmm. um this whole thing about colorblind casting um which is nothing more than a way for people who do not want to face the strength in the color of my skin for them to kind of just skip over it or the strength and the victory that has come through that, but also kind of the struggles and the trials that have yes, come through yes. people of color um, for us to be able to face that. So they're like colorblind. It doesn't matter. It does matter because people made sure it mattered. And until we get to a point where it truly doesn't matter, there's no such thing as colorblind casting. I just want to put Amen. that but Amen and hallelujah. You asked for solutions <laughs> or possible <laughs> solutions. <laughs> Um, One thing is inclusion, right? It's being mindful that you have more than one type of voice or more than one experience at the table. Because once you have someone else, right? Once you have that different train of thought, those different experiences at the table, and they have the true ability to kind of counter or combat what you're saying, and you can do so Mm -hmm. on a level playing field or you can do so with shared decision-making power. It gets to the point where you are forced to consider other people's experiences. You're mm-hmm. forced to consider why this is upsetting to someone. I thought it was great, you know, I loved it, but you're upset. And then once that person is at the table and can truly tell you why they're upset or why this is not okay, or different ways that you can go about doing this and creating this art, that's when we'll start truly creating an environment when everyone feels like they can contribute get some people in there to actually contribute and not simply I just need color on the stage because I assure you you need it in the audiences you need it in the staff you need it in casting you need it in the orchestra you need it everywhere not just on stage so as we go about doing these things um, our leadership for all of the organizations need to be mindful that we have to create opportunities and then we have to commit to supporting those who are able to take advantage of those opportunities and not so much of, I'm just gonna go grab this person because they're this color or they represent this group, right? Not even just color and race, but that they represent this group that has kind of been locked out of the art form for quite some time. 
Well, absolutely. And when when that's to me, it that speaks to a we could do an entire series on this we subject will. alone, and we will. Um, but. Um, David, what are your thoughts on that? Because I know me personally, I, you know, working in education, it's a, it's a big deal for me whenever we go to the casting table and we're talking about this because of the communities we serve. And we need to go to the ca casting table with the understanding that not everybody came from the same kind of advantages, the same kind of training. Mm -hmm. Nobody, not everybody had the same opportunity. And quite frankly, a lot of the times when they haven't had that same opportunity, and I can only speak to this country in particular, it's because of things like structural racism. And so it's, be it's because of racial disparities. And that's just the absolute truth. Yep. We can pull out historical documents to that effect. And so that's not throwing blame on anybody. That's saying, how do we fix it? You know, how do we, when we, when we approach these situations where we're, we have the task of diversifying our audiences, our, our stage, our orchestra, like Paul was saying, you know, how do we approach it? Uh, I think I think you know like um, one one of the things that that and I, and it's kind of a convoluted answer. I was successful to get a place in the performing world and then in the administration world because I talking about fighting for your space and that translates in in several issues, right? Um, it was because I took a very very you know, I come from Mexico where you have to hustle. I, I, there's just no social security. There's no student loans. <laughs> I didn't even have the privilege to get in debt to, 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 to sing, right? You know, to learn singing. I, the, there's no conservatories, like luxuries that are incredibly um, amazing when you cross the river and you're like, oh my God, you know, like this, this exists, right? So, I learned the the language of 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 you know like man hours and 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 money impact. So the way that I elbow myself was that I deliver a package that was a multi skillful package for a, a compensation that was very very low, but I guarantee me employment when I needed to 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 get ahead. You know I. I knew that I was a very successful high C tenor when I came into singing, but I knew that at the time that if I wanted to get opportunities, I had to to charge way less and establish singers, right? Oh, uh, because I didn't have any credibility. I didn't have any credit score. I didn't have a car. I didn't have any of these things. So I needed to take whatever was able. So I had to like brought a very, very high skill package at a lower price in order to compete. And that happened to me exactly the same later when I came into administration. I, I got sick and I couldn't continue singing, but I am a computer science engineer. I speak five languages. I have won the, the World Cup of Singing and I did a lot of many things that I, that I in, in the singing career short, but very, very sweet and high profile that I could do. And I have a master's in marketing. I didn't go to music school, right? So I, but I came to, to my, I, I tried to apply to so many jobs and nobody listened to me. Mm. And so finally there was a job booking travel at the Dallas Opera. And that's how, how I got in. So immediately what I realized is that I needed to bring cash value to my position in order to, to be paid attention. The, mo the moment that I, in the first two weeks, I saved $20,000 of the budget by, by changing, by implementing a, a paperless strategy. They were like, oh, and then I say 40 by changing our travel policy. And I was like, hmm. And so it started to do like this, right? Like little by little, I started to save money or, or, or stretch the budget in a different way. And I was like, for me, like I'm Mexican. I'm like, I, I, this is what we do, you know? And awesome. we, we find a way. And, and so my, my spear, maybe not, not as altruistic sometimes as what you guys do, that you guys defend the, the front line with, with everything that you guys got. But like, I, I felt that I was like, I want to go really, really high end. You know, eventually I want to be a CEO of the biggest company in the planet. And then that's how we're going to do. But I have to sell my soul a tiny bit, you know, like some, it's not easy. It's not easy. And I, and I understand that. And that's, that's part of the solution for me is that I needed to address the fact that there was nobody through the sweat, the scars, the discrimination, 
the 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 situations that I have gone at the border patrols when I immigrate the country, and even when I come back from singing, all these experiences that that traumatize you, uh, in order to they say like no one is gonna feel it until somebody that is at the helm make a decision that takes care of those people. Because yeah. even now in the crisis of Corona, like it did count it that there were singers and performers at the leadership table. They understood yeah. that we were not just a number and we needed to take care of everybody, not only the staff and not only the shareholders. We needed to take care of our artists, right? So the same thing happened. It, it was, I felt in a way that I got sick and, I, and, and all these things happened to me in order to be in this position because uh, they needed to somebody to be in that decision-making table, right? And say like, this is not okay because right. they are no. human beings because they're that so for me i think that one of the solutions is that when we are seeing talent and you're very good christian at this like i, I learned one thing that it's i have to make the commercial of, of christian when i sit with you in auditions for our education and outreach you know i try to come from from the casting director years when i need results in the next 24 years in the 24 months and and i kind of evaluate like okay this is going to take 36 months maybe it's not going to happen but you're like okay well it's 24 months but maybe we're going to go faster because this person has never been fed properly mm -hmm. they've never been trained properly and then if maybe they that because they have those faculties that you see that i was like oh my god this, this is long term but the moment that that person gets from a, maybe a minority or mar marginalized part of the society come in but they are trained at the highest level it's only they bypass because they have more talent they have more attitude they have more hunger and they have more skills of survival that is so needed in this art form in whatever way you see it that i started to to buy into this and it's like okay maybe i buy this that is in theory looks more like a a diamond in the rough but and i have seen it constantly now with some of the kids that we have brought that that some of these marginalized individuals, you, you hustle them the right way, you educate them the right way, and they go at the speed of lining, yeah. contrary to the people that have, that have been corn fed every day, right? Right. So it's, but, it, it, but there's, a, there's a difference, but I, I was that person. And I know what it's like to have somebody actually take me under their wing. And for me, it's about paying it forward. And it's about seeing that hunger and knowing that some people might not have the money for that audition or mm -hmm. might not be able to buy that dress or might not be able to get that plane ticket. It's not that they can't sing. It's not that their languages are not great. It's just that they can't even get on the plane. Yeah. You know, to get to the audition because they're working three jobs just to make enough money to be broke. Yeah. And so I know that person because I was that person and I understand it. And so in the same way you've tried to use your position to see those things, I've tried to do the same thing. And it's something that Cole and I discuss all the time because I think it's very important that no matter what school we go to in this city, no matter what organization we are working with, no matter what other theater we're going to be partnering with, no matter what uh, retirement home or what it is, I think it's very important that they see people all different colors, shapes, and sizes mm -hmm. working together. And I think it's important that we look to try to foster that talent and we try to foster that kind of environment, not just so black kids can see black kids, uh, uh, black, black people on stage. Yeah. No, it's the, 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 every kid needs to see that. They need to right. see people in leadership position. Every kid, every person needs to get used to seeing somebody who looks like them or doesn't look like them, but is working together in a group. That is the way the world looks, whether people like it or not, it is the way the world looks. And you have a lot of people right now that are um, maybe very careful about how I say this, who uh, have bought into some sort of superiority that is not really there. What has been there has been advantage. Right. You've had advantage. And yeah. And it is what it is. That's the historical context. My point is, what are we going to do now? Mm -hmm. What are we going to do to create that space? So one, that's one thing I love when, 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 when Cole talks about this, because we talk about creating the space for everybody to be successful. But then I get the question of, and either one of you can take this, is why does this matter? Why does any of this matter? You know, if, if you got people that you're, you're auditioning or people that you're interviewing for the job or, or anything like that, and, you know, the best candidate gets it. Why, but why is it important to look at people's backgrounds? 
before making decisions to actually go on the hunt for, I, for viable. I think. I think we can go in so many levels, but I, I want I want to be like my grandma, my abuela used to say, you know, sometimes the simplest response is the, is the biggest one, because it's the right thing, you know, because it's because it's it's because music is not exclusive of a of a size of a wallet, of a or just because I don't have a blue passport is it's green or I have an accent, or I look different, or I don't grow my mustache here, which is very Mexican genetics. Like, it's very specific, you know, like, and it's why we have the Heart Institute for Women Conductors. Yeah. And, and that's why we have an incredible diversity in our young performers in the education and outreach department. And that's why we have one of the highest ratios of diversity in our casting, because also they, you know, we want to tell stories where they empower. I, mm -hmm. you know, like I, one of the things that like kill me for, for this coronavirus was I couldn't see Morris Robinson sing Filippo Secondo, like sing his uh, as the uh, king of oh. Spain, you know, like I wanted to see him empower to sing a, a king there. Yeah, and not sort of astronaut, like a historical figure that he was going to be empowered with one of the best music ever written in the planet, right? Exactly. It was just that powerful thing. And it was like, I want to see, I have seen so many white dudes do it, mm -hmm. but I want to see how it feels. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And that was a position that because I was in the casting chair, we were able to, to, to sell it to the board, to sell it to leadership, to be empowered to do it. And he trained his behind to do it. And it's painful that we didn't get to experience it because it was the right thing because we have to be non-exclusive. It's not about who or where you're born or anything. It's like music is for every single human being. And that's the principle because it's the right thing for me. And maybe it's very high end, but for me, that's the simple answer. It's, it's because if they have the talent, we should be able to foster. I got invested a lot of money in my career. I I am a f I, I have costed to several families in the United States and in Mexico almost like half a million dollars in training, mm -hmm. you know. And and this is how it looks, you know. But 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 you have to be able to have those. And I know, and that's why I know that that I'm so privileged and so blessed to be one of those that I fight so hard from the ones that are behind. I feel you. you no, know? so I feel you on that. Quo, your thoughts? Like Davi said, it's the right thing to do. That was kind of the first thing we started. But yeah. even for those of us who are business minded, right, it's also the smart thing to do. Because if you continuously only appeal to a certain demographic, as that demographic gets older, as that demographic stops caring, as that demographic expects to see people who look like them and who do not look like them, it is unwise to continue in a vein or on a path that is exclusive of others. Right. So we'll come with the kind of the spirit of it. Yes, it is the right thing to do. And then it's the smart thing to do, because otherwise you miss out on the opportunity to truly ensure that your organization and that your art form is being supported and that there is a future for your art form, because if you're only restricting it to those who have had access or those you feel are the best because they've had advantage and you're dismissing others, then you are excluding and suffocating your art form. So yes, it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I will say that, and that's something that we talked about last week. You can look at anybody that is looking at their business right now. And I've always said, I have never understood in a society that is built on capitalism and that talks about capitalism and and you know free market and all of this kind of stuff and and to turn a, to to let these kinds of things get in the way of business if anything yes it's the right thing to do it's the moral thing to do but on the flip side of that it's the business it's the business side of it is such a huge part of it in every industry not just the arts every industry is having to look at this right now and look at what it means and why it's important so I think we've tried to solve all the problems of the world and <laughs> right part now, <laughs> part, part one right now. Um, right. But I, I know we need to wrap this up, but I, I and cause we've gone a little bit, a little bit over, but I, I want to um, just talk about this because uh, um, as far as, cause we do a conversation invitation at the end of every show. We tell people to come and tell us what you think. 
Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I, we make sure we do is talk about positive things. Because right now we've talked about a lot of things that are heavy and we touch on a, thing, a lot of things that are heavy and we'll, we, we will be talking some more. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one thing that I do want to do, make sure that we talk about is the positive things that are going on in this kind of work. And the biggest thing that we always talk about, because the conversation like this, we talk about grace, we talk about doing this with respect, and we talk about doing this with truth. And all of us have a truth. All of us have a truth, and then there is the truth. Yep. <laughs> and we have a, a story that we li we've lived. Um, so what are some of the things that we can do? So what, right now we talk about some of the solutions. We talked about some of our experiences. What do we do now? What's the next part? What are the positive things about all of this, about having these conversations right now? I, I think that, for example, this, this particular trio, that we're going to push this in an institutional channel that, that now, and totally I'm doing a commercial a little bit of, but with, this morning we were at 750,000 people following now the Dallas Opera, uh, in, you know, like conversations that we're having in content. Right, I think that that it sheds a light on that we care. I think that is rare that institutional opera looks like us right now, yeah, and yeah, sounds so. like this, and it's and it's conscious about it. So I think that that this is a good thing, you know. Like we didn't have access to leadership places, we didn't have access to be the faces of institutions. We did we, we didn't have the creative uh, liberty to go in and like. You know, we're going to create this and our boss says, okay, vaya con Dios and, and go ahead and let's see how it goes, you know. And so I think also the, the, the precise moment where we are with coronavirus, with, with where the art form it is, we're in a particular moment that it, there's no way to feel our feelings for a long time. We have to go into action because we're not only playing for, for the next opera, we're playing for survival of the art form in the long term, in a sustainable way. And as what Paul says, it's smart to diversify risk. You know, right now, if, if one major, one ethnicity donor like decides to give money to another uh, thing, because it's part of the, the, the needs of the world, you know, maybe we're gonna pull a little bit onto the arts to put into the cure, right? Very respectful, right? But, but how do we t keep taking care of the people that are already invested in as a, as a life form? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that diversifying our risk is just a very smart business decision that is starting to be talked. But uh, actually, the beautiful thing of coronavirus is like, and one of the things that frustrates me the most sometimes in the opera conversation is like, people are happy to just have a conversation and it bothers me. It's like, but yeah, but when are we going to actually do something? Mm -hmm. Well, coronavirus, the positive thing is that now it has put this to like right now. We Maybe. have to do this. So I think that the good thing is that now we don't have to go to the opera house for a moment. We don't have to go to so many places. Everybody has level feel because they have a Facebook account, an Instagram account, and you can say things and you can sing and you can actually market. And so it, it has opened a lot of channels to say what we need to say without filters, without marquees, without like fear about to say it and be heard. So I think the positive thing is like, this is the moment this is our time, and I just totally quoted Jekyll and Hyde. But to be, to be truth, you know, to, to speak the truth and create action plans. So I think that for me, I'm actually exciting on these times. Like, we're, we're ready to go, you know, and which is the best people to survive in tough times? People who can hustle. People know how to hustle. I know how to work, how to know how to roll up those, those sleeves and not afraid of work. Um, Quote, what about you? What do you think? For kind of positive notes, um, it's, as always, just kind of be mindful that other people have different lived experiences. Like you said, we all have our truths, and then there is the truth, which is kind of a culmination of all of our truths together. We don't see everything um, that happens, and we don't understand everything or every decision. But if you have millions of people telling you that this is an issue, trust that it is an issue. Right. It is not simply there. Again, that people are just wanting to make bad decisions because that's right. fun. It's not. Um, nor is it fun to um, kind of 
face that oppression or face those barriers or be told that you are you don't have access because of different things or that you're not good enough um, because clearly you are. Uh, there are just other issues. So we want to face truth, but do so with grace and do so with accountability, right? Once you see that there is an issue, do something about it. We spoke about how equity and equality are not the same things because mm -hmm. equity takes more work. Do the work. That's all. So and then do the work and know that you don't have to do that work alone. Right. So that's a positive note I want to leave for everyone. Well, and then I, I think one of the things that you, you said before, and it's, it's for us to see those around us, you know, to understand and embrace differences. And I think that's one of the positive notes and one of the positive things about being able to have this conversation in this time. So I think, you know, we have call to action here. You know, we have a call to action. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think that we are in a good place to talk about this, like David said. And I think um, looking at this moving forward, we have, there, there's been a lot said on here. We have a lot more to say, but we should wrap up. Um, yes. But I will say, folks, please look in the comment section. Um, come and tell us your experiences. Tell us what you faced. Um, be bold. Um, tell the truth. Uh, and also, you know, um, Follow us. We always say that you can you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us everywhere. I want to thank David for being here with us today and, and for taking the time. Uh, it's been a very interesting conversation. Um, also, my fabulous co-host, Quo Johnson, um, just is a, I mean, just as a force to be reckoned with. So um, we're going to sign off now. We appreciate you joining us. Shout out to TDO for giving us this platform. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.